are so excited today to be interviewing Susan McGreevy Nichols. She's the Executive Director and CEO of NDEO, and we are absolutely delighted. I can't wait to have this conversation with a fellow New Englander. Susan, welcome, welcome to Global Conversations Round 4. Thank you, Liza. I'm, I'm excited to be here. It's, I'm, I have lots of stories. I am, I'm dying to hear your stories. So tell us a little bit about your background. We found out you're from Rhode Island, which we talked about a little bit. What led you to arts education and eventually to the National Dance Education Organization? Well, I, I am a native Rhode Islander. The first 50 years of my life, I lived in Rhode Island. So, and, and I'll tell you when I went to, as part of my story, what took me out of Rhode Island at some point. So in 1974, right out of college, I began teaching at Roger Williams Middle School in Providence, Rhode Island. I know yeah. it, I know it, I know it, that's so Come cool. On. Oh my goodness, okay, okay. okay. I'm driven by there like twice, okay. okay. <laughs> Yes, so it, it's not it's not the good side of the highway, you know. It's not on the Brown University side, in the Risby side of the highway. It's on the other side, <laughs> the real side of town. That's right. But you know what? Loved it. Um, so this inner city middle school um, has had about and still has, I'm sure, 900 students, of which 99% of them qualify for free and reduced lunch. Most of the students were minority, largely black and Hispanic. Yep. After the Vietnam War, we had a, a sizable increase of um, a Southeast Asian population who migrated, um, immigrated rather, um, including the um, Hmong boat people who yep. Yep. As, as refugees. They're, and they're Fisher people, right? Yes, yes. So these minority populations greatly benefited my dance program by, by sharing and performing and teaching their cultural dances. I learned so much from those students. So let me tell you a little bit about my dance background, yes, or please. such as it is. Okay, I claim to be a wannabe dancer because I really haven't had formal training. Um, I did, however, have great people that I got to work with over the years. Um, my degree is in physical education. I went to the University of Rhode Island. Um, I had a few dance classes, but especially enjoyed the dance composition courses. Although I would not consider myself a trained in any particular genre or not at all, um, I had a knack for choreography. I could see the dances in my mind. Um, my program at Roger Williams began the first year with seven students just hanging out after school. Over the years, the program grew into a full-time program with 600 of the 900 students in the school in grades six, seventh, and eighth involved in the program. Wait a minute, you went from seven kids to how many hundred? 600. Wow, seven to 600. So I'd say things were going well. Yes, and again, I was there for 28 years. Okay. So, you know, this wasn't year two. You know, this is how it evolved over a, a period. On. Um, so the students were taking dances, the classes were the full time program really was um, no longer through physical education, but as an art form as an art elective. Um, we, we had three full time dance teachers that I eventually I was able to hire these additional teachers. I was really good at raising money, but the population that I worked with were very fundable. You know, we got a lot of a lot of federal money as a result of it. No, we're not talking about a collegiate program. We're talking about a middle school in a in a not particularly rich area. It's not like you know a glitzy Connecticut suburb. That's right. That's right. But it really was to my advantage because I was able to um, really piggyback a lot of grants and a lot of federal funding. And of course, I also got um, you know money from our district. So it was really. Um, you know, it made th we made things work. Plus, we used to charge for performances. Um, like that, we used to, and I'll go into that a little bit more. We actually had different touring companies that would go and perform. We were a bigger presenter than, and this is probably a terrible thing to say, than any other dance, you know, company, professional company in the state. That's we extraordinary. I mean, it's a small state, but that's still extraordinary. And oh my goodness. What an opportunity for these kids, right? Many of whom probably really didn't get a chance to travel outside their own community. Yeah, absolutely. Exactly. I can remember going to Little Compton 
we again two busloads of kids okay right. and here we are going here and the kids are looking out the window and these are kids from from haiti in the dominican and they're looking out the window and go oh, they have plantations oh boy <laughs> yeah you know it's like they have plantations and and to them that was you know many of them had never gotten out of their neighborhoods yeah in their case yeah. you know they were they had gotten out of their country but again they they live a very um in a very small part of this city yep and basically and i had generations um i you know when i was ready to retire kids would say oh you had my grandmother <laughs> and i'm like oh my goodness okay. right shorter shorter generations but still you can you can see the impact i think one of the benefits of being embedding yourself someplace and really digging in and making something grow right yes absolutely and and the thing is i i really loved i mean i could have transferred to another school or maybe try to get a number a, a, a job in another you know another school district but you know what i really loved it it really grew on you i mean it was an amazing first of all it was an amazing program um you know better than many in other states yeah uh, but also i love the kids you know they sure they were a little, lift, a little rough around the edges and i was when i was hired for you know my ndeo job and i said you know what just want to tell you number one i'm a rule breaker number two i'm a little rough around the edges <laughs> kind of kind you know kind of didn't need that polish at middle school you know <laughs> now we got to we got to we got to somehow leave roger williams medical middle school in rhode island and now you're running a national organization yeah Don't yeah do that um so you want me to jump to that yeah just sort of you you mentioned santa monica and then all of a sudden we're in washington dc and you're running a national organization i am um well um that again um i first of all i'm a founding member of ndeo okay so so i've been there since the beginning um i was president um at the time when uh, Jane Bonbright who was the founding founding executive director you know she had been trying encouraging the board to find someone to uh take over for her and you know they just never quite got around to it and so i was offered the job and actually it was offered the job like 7 years before i actually took it and she kept on me she says really you know we we have the same you know the the same uh passion for this work and for NDEO and I really think you're the perfect person to um to do this and that's when she kind of warmed me off but you know I wonder about you know I'm a little rough around the edges you know working 28 years in the inner city middle school that, you know that, that kind of training for Washington DC I don't know I <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes so um you know I finally uh, things my my uh Uh, independent work that i was doing um in at that time in um the la area started to dry up i mean they in 2010 is when i actually 2012 things really it's like the 2008 crash really really hit them hard you know it took a little while to get out there and the schools were, were cutting teachers and so they certainly weren't going to bring in any teaching artists to do this so Um I you know I said and I called her up and I said hey is that job still available and she's going yes so I moved and then stayed lived with her for in uh fe- moved in February lived with her for a couple of months and I began my job officially May 1st in 2012 Um and as I tell everyone I I had to move from my ocean front apartment which was like you know like a tiny little you know place but it was gorgeous and moved to Silver Spring Maryland so in it, it just because it was a DC kind of job you had to live there sure. so you know it was it was interesting um and it's been uh it's been a wonderful experience uh, i'm kind of going i'm in my ninth year and um you know it's it's always a challenge there's always something new there's always something going on how many how many members do you have We have um uh, 4000 a little less after covid but um it'll increase it was only a, we only had a 3% um decrease which is not bad at all we really were we were just sweating it out that we would have um a bigger 
cut. You mentioned that um, that the challenges you, you face have been changing. How is the field different now than it was when you got there? Um, you know what? I honestly, I don't think it's changed that much. Okay. Um, you know, our, our primary, um, you know, we, we serve as higher ed and K-12. We also have private studios and we have community arts organizations. Oh, that, really? oh yeah, yeah. And performing arts organizations that have education arms that belong to us. So it really has stayed pretty um, close to the certain percentages that um, are across the uh, the board. So we one third of the membership is is K twelve. One third is higher ed, and then one third is the private studios and the performing arts organizations and teaching artists and you know that group of people who are kind of um, in a, in an independent, um, you know, not more of a contractual type situation. Now, I want to get back to sort of your background and the five books you've written, but. Talk a little bit about the services that um, you've provided to the community during the pandemic. What are, what are some of the favorites of these resources and what have you been able to do to support your community? The, the COVID crisis had really gave us many silver linings. We, um, we had one of the biggest things is that we had to get out of our comfort zone by reacting quickly. Well, believe me, we don't react quickly. We like to think things out and develop them and spend a little time thinking about it a little bit more. And so when this came, it's like, oh my God, <laughs> you know, it's like, well, we can't wait a year. We have to do it now. And so that was probably the biggest change for us, but it was good for us. You know, it was really good for us to, to know that we could do this and do it successfully. So some of the things that we did is we created the Teaching Dance Online series. And that involved 16 free webinars that are open, that were open to not only members, but to non-members. So because of that, over 3,000 teachers have attended these sessions so far. And now we're continuing them because we realize what a great um, impact that has on the field. And all our members are the ones who, who like did these, um, an assortment of different topics um, of webinars. Those webinars really, all those had to do with special um, challenges and, and yep. Yep. aspects that had to do with COVID and how people kind of got through it. So the people in, in the private sector did one, the people in high ed did one in, you know, at K-12. So it really was a, a great way, you know, so how do you do blending? How do you do online together at the same time? And how do you, how do you get the music to, to sound better? You know, it was, it was just all these things that, you know, where do you, where do you put the, the, the camera to make it look more, you know, make you look more natural? Um, uh, you know, how do you, how do you teach the kids who are out there, you know? So I'm, and, hearing, I'm hearing three things from this. One is it's really collaborative. It's members. Oh, members. oh yes. Hierarchical at, at all. It's this sort of do it yourself. We got your back. Let's figure it out together. The second thing I'm hearing is that it's um, it's really made a difference, right, to your members. And the third is that you know, silver lining the pandemic, you're probably going to keep doing this. You're going to use this. Yes. Yeah. And and you know, you go after a while, you kind of get set in your ways, and you know, because you're successful. I mean, we literally were growing eight percent every year. Wow. Good for you, Susan. You know. So hey, why? You know why? Um, you know. What are they? What's the saying? Um, Rock the boat. Not, yep. If it's not broke, don't fix it. So we kind of did that and, and continued to grow and we're, we're very successful. And all of a sudden this happened and it was like, oh my God, you know, honestly, we thought we were, we did everything we could to, um, we applied for, you know, and we have a wonderful director of, of finance, our staff member, Vilma um, Rama. She's incredible. And she wrote all these, you know, the PPP, you know, to keep payroll and, and uh, she brought in grants and, and um, federal loans that, that you don't end up pay, paying back. Um, and, and then we also got, you know, quite a few donations. You know, our members are very supportive of each other. 
Um, and, and they, you learn again, if, if you get in a situation where maybe you're changing your population, you know, we have our conferences, which normally have like 200 plus, um, sessions. Yeah. Uh, this year we, we did it virtually. There was another change and I'll tell you what, we had over a thousand people come to that conference in 2020, attend that online conference. And that's also something that we're going to try to do a face-to-face -face conference in the future and a virtual conference. And now, I, I love that because it makes it ex accessible. Yeah. I can use that word correctly today. It yeah. makes it accessible, doable, and economically feasible for so many dance teachers who might not be in major urban areas, who don't have the budget to get somewhere. Yes. And I I think it's really doing a service to your, to, you know, to your teachers, but also, frankly, to dance in general, to be able to rethink it and get that material out there, which is really what we're trying to do here with Global Conversations. I want people to understand better what makes up the economy and the art of dance, right? Right. Right. Absolutely. But it was incredible. And I think at the time when we, you know, we did our survey at the end of, of conferences, which we always do, 43% had never attended an, an NDEO conference. That's extraordinary. So of course we said, well, guess what? We have to do this from now on because that is what's making that, you know, this is making it accessible. Now we know that people still love the face-to-face. -face. There's a lot to be said for face-to-face. -face. So, you know, we're gonna try to do both and see, you know, do something in June and then do our face-to-face -face in October, which we normally do. Um, we were very fortunate. We got out of two years of of um, contracts with our hotel without a without a, um, a wow. penalty. I mean, the penalty could have been two hundred fifty thousand dollars. Holy moly! Do you move your conferences around, or is it always in yes. always in the same place? Okay. No, we always we we do it again because to be accessible to everyone. So we go from East Coast to the center of the company. West Coast and then back East Coast. Good, 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 good cool. Yeah, we're hoping um, we're we're co-hosts of the Women in Dance Leadership Conference, which was started by Sandra Park. Oh, I remember that. Yeah, yeah. I remember hearing about it. I, I spoke. I spoke at their uh, conference two years ago in Philadelphia. It's going to be in Chicago uh -huh. this year, and boy, fingers crossed that um, that we're able to have it. And we're the conference is actually honoring Catherine Dunham. Um, oh, the Dunham wonderful. method. Yeah, and which brings me to, I want to talk before we circle back around about your scholarship and the journals, I want to talk a little bit about this fabulous initiative, JEDI. You know, over the past year, we've really strived to support our members in the field and, and during the challenging COVID-19 pandemic. So starting in 2021, you know, this year we decided that we would finally work towards um, this making our, our um, organization more accessible and more diverse because you know we do have we we are heavy on white women you know so we know that we have to do things and there are reasons why um, we're not um, uh, we, you know we're not picking up other cultural um, groups as members so we're we are doing initiating the Jedi which is stands for justice equity diversity and inclusion. And we've hired the Maryland nonprofits to as a consultant. We have two consultants from that that um, nonprofit to um, review the organization of our programs through the lens of Jedi. So um, basically, it's a year long initiative, which will help provide a roadmap for organization and pro programmatic changes over the next few years. Um, and it real basically it as it we embody our commitment to becoming an anti-racist organization. So that's our big goal. Um, so we have actually a hundred members who applied to do this, who will be working in small teams to look through, you know, look, look under the hood, so to speak, and examine all of our programs, entities, and systems to see you know, where there might be problems. So um, early in March, actually through March, we have four trainings for that, those groups and they are going to be given the, the tools that they need and what and the look for's to see what, you know, what might cause someone yeah. not, to, um, not to be a member. 
in, the three, in, three words that come to mind when you're talking about this and you're talking about it earlier is um, fearless. You're actually looking at the problem. You're not running away for it. Um, forensic, you're actually really doing a deep dive and trying to figure out where are the barriers, you know, what's stopping people from joining and collaborative, you're including your members who you said are super supportive and, and signed up in droves apparently to do this. Droves, uh, it was like, oh my God. And, and people are, you know, as I'm getting right now, they're confirming their, their um, involvement. And I mean, just gushing at how thrilled they are and how honored they are to work on this. And they all have, you know, they don't all have, but they have, again, it comes from all of our sectors and all of our age levels. And we have a diverse group of people. I mean, it's just, it's incredible. It yeah. really is incredible. It's wonderful. One, we were, we're interviewing Ashley Bowder for this series and she just wrote a new book, Welcome to Ballet Class. And I love the idea that the first day a child walks into ballet class, they're really welcomed, the fullness of who they are, you know, and that they see other black and brown faces and that the teacher is ready to teach, you know, those students. And then you go all the way up to the university level, you've got completely, completely different problems, but also the same in some yeah, ways. Yeah, yeah, you know, kids, then, kids, you know, they, 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 they all react the same way, you know, but it's important that they, that they feel like they're, in that comfort zone. Yep. Yeah, and that they're and that they're seen. I mean, Erica Edwards, who's now on our advisory council, and I talked in round one about the fact that she was trained badly because her ballet teachers, and this is at a very high level, kept telling her her posterior was too big. So tuck under your butt, tuck under your butt, which is wrong training. I actually had that too, because I have a, a pretty powerful rear end. And it's fascinating to me. We get a lot of conversations around things like hair. And you know, not understanding that it takes women of color longer to, to change out their hair, as well as the obviously much more complex issues. So you you've got a, a you know you've got a hundred people working on Jedi. You're going to do a deep dive for a year, and then what happens when you find the results? Well, then we're going to be working on with again groups to to kind of look at all the data, and we will have a plan. Um, before, you know, by the end of the year that there is a plan in a roadmap and we will basically, you know, make kind of prioritize what has to be fixed. And we know things have to be, have to be fixed. And, and we're really, you know, dedicated to making those fixes. Now we may not be able to do all of them. I mean, obviously I'll tell you, oh, well, don't charge anything for your services. Well, that doesn't work because we won't have our doors open very long. Right. You know, we have we have three major programs that we earn our income. I mean, that's we we don't make it on on like our professional uh, membership is one hundred and fifteen dollars. And if it's a state, if you have a state affiliate, you pay the state thirty dollars of that. And and we're living on the balance. Ah, not so much. Yeah. Um, and, and honestly, I, I wish we got more donations. We have some, you know, a major funder, which we're very pleased with. Um, but really in terms of, and, and honestly, during the pandemic, our, our individual donations have increased, but basically- Add some faith in you all. Talk about, talk about a thumbs up and it's got to make you feel great about yourself. Clearly, oh my God. What you're doing is critical, right? Yeah. Yeah, but you know, it's, it, it comes down to, and I had a funder actually say this, you know, why should I give to you when, you know, we have people who are dying and people, you know, people who are starving and, and sick kids, you know, they're more important than dance educators. Yeah, as a, as a funder, obviously I'm constantly balancing, but at least what I'm hearing for you from you is huge amounts of energy, collaborative, enthusiastic membership and a, a really clear path forward. But you also have, you personally have this other side and then NDEO has a scholarly side. So tell us about your five, five books, five books, five. Okay, first of all, honestly, never in my life did I think I would be publishing five books. And honestly, I am so lucky. I have these incredible, um, I, I kind of provided the raw materials and, and I'll tell you how I, how I did that. Um, but. I have these wonderful co-authors who are also teachers in my program. I, you know, I hired them to, to you know, teach for me. So 
but basically what I did is I, every time I would, cause I brought a lot of, a lot of um, teachers and, and um, choreographers in to work in my program. I mean, I'm talking again, I brought in a lot of money. Um, I brought in people such as Chuck Davis, Salam, you know, Abdel Salam, Masha Romaine, Tom Cobb, William Adair, and many, many others. My students had the opportunity to work with many choreographers um, that they would work with after school. And again, I had these wonderful, Marty and Helene were incredible teachers and really knew their stuff. Again, I'm a wannabe dancer. I learned from them. I learned from the, my students. I learned from, you know, all the people that we brought into the, into the program. So really that was my training. Um, so getting back to the books, um, I, I collected I, when I, it, before I had all these people coming in, whenever someone would come and do a, a master class or something, I would write down a movement on, a, on an index card and put it down. And then I'd write another one down and then I'd write another, you know, so I wouldn't forget them, what they were. And so eventually I had this stack of, of um, index cards and they became the uh, dealer deck for building dances. And the name of that, that, that uh, activity that basically was um, deal a dance. And so basically we'd, it was um, broken into categories and you would give like three of this color and two of that color and you know, one of that. And I would hand them to groups of students and they had to create a dance, putting those things together. Do you have any of this on video? It would be so much fun to watch. Old videos <laughs> that I have to have re, you know, re, uh, Mastered, whatever you call yeah. it. Yeah, I've got boxes of them, and and I have incredible conference. I mean, concerts that I really wish I had time to and the money to to get it done. But it they are they were incredible, absolutely incredible the pieces of choreography. Again, my kids had no training. Sure, they came with raw talent, and even you know just their bodies. I yeah. mean, they they were creative, and and the big thing is that we. Um, approached our curriculum and our books through the creative process. So they were always creating based on some type of inspiration. So um, Deal Dance really became the basis for um, building dances and then building dances too. And after that, we worked on um, uh, Dance About Anything. And Dance About Anything really came from, again, um, because I needed tools, because there wasn't really a lot of resource sources out there that could break it down in a simple way. And I think that is my gift of writing, is I can make things very easy to understand. That's, I can break things down. I, I don't like fluffy words. That's a huge gift. Yeah. So I, you know, I could break things down because I wasn't a good student myself. And basically, I don't react to being lectured. So I had to, in, all through college, I had to basically reteach myself um, in order to understand the concepts and break them down. So uh, that ended up making me a really good teacher as a result of it. Anyway, going back to the books. So um, uh, Dance About Anything, I would put together these uh, again, I wanted to build things that the kids could work on. And I would put together inspiration packets. And the kids would kind of look through like readings and pictures and, and a number of things. And they all were about some subject, such as um, the Gannets. Uh, National Geographic was my gold mine. I would tear pages out of National Geographic and that would be the, the, <laughs> the, the inspiration. And so we, we did dances about the gannets, like diving in, oh, yeah, yeah. kill the sardines, eat the sardines and all the ruckus. And the best writing is seriously in National Geographic. They have such vivid language and you need that vivid language in order to create, you know, a lot of movement. Um, and, and so that kind of takes me to the, oh, and then we did um, Experiencing Dance, which was um, a textbook commissioned by um, Texas. And that was a full, you know, high school textbook. So that was also, again, it was, it was around creating, responding, and um, performing. 
I have to switch and talk to you about the NDEO journals. And I understand there's two and they kind of serve different different functions. They do. So um, the thing is that um, they're both published by Taylor and Francis, which is an international pu publisher, which is really good. Um, they're both peer reviewed. However, Jode is kind of your typical resource journal. It was our first journal and, and actually um, it, it, and I don't know, I never really delve into it deeply, but um, they would do both in practice, which is kind of their hands-on type um, mm -hmm. examples, and also research-based. Now that we have um, DEEP, which is dance education in practice, that is absolutely just an in-practice journal. And usually as part of that, we encourage first-time writers or writers who don't feel confident um, submitting to Jode, which can be yep. very intimidating. Yep. It is intimidating. I looked at the guidelines. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it is intimidating. But you get assigned a mentor who works with you in helping you write the um, your your um, your. And again, so welcoming and so like, let's create the next generation of scholars, which is just yeah. wonderful. And also for people that. Um, have brilliant ideas, um, but don't, but uh, don't want to don't want to go through the entire academic procedure. That's wonderful. Um, before we finish, and I could just I really want to take you out for a drink and hang out, like all day. Yeah. yeah. When the Jedi report comes out, we really want to publish it. And oh, that would yes, that would be wonderful. Uh, I'm I'm so impressed. I've seen far less uh, well thought out and and serious endeavors looking at this. Anyway. What a delight. Susan McGreen Nichols, thank you so much. What an inspiration on every level. Um, we're delighted to um, interview you and we cannot wait to hear more about NDEO and your plans. What, what, a, what an incredible organization. Thank you so much.